In this video, we'll look at section 2.1.1 in Stein's Elementary Number Theory book. And so this is about linear equations mod n. So again, maybe a little bit familiar to some steps you might have done in like an intro to proofs class. So what we're looking at is a linear equation modulo n has this form. Ax is equivalent to b mod n. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to just solve it for x. So this is supposed to be pretty similar to, you know, in the integers without this modular stuff. I know that there are some rules that I get. I get ax equals b. What I'd like to be able to do is figure out what x is equal to. And what we tell our students to do, you know, if a and b are real numbers, say, or rational numbers or whatever, you, know, you could just divide by a as long as it's not zero. So I want to know what are my kind of uh, equation solving tools in this different number system, if you will, in this different ring. So when does this thing have a solution? So the first thing that we need is when can I cancel stuff? So like, you know, if you have a uh, you know, 3x is equal to 3y, we take for granted that uh, in the integers, I can just cancel those threes and everything's fine. I get x equals y. We've got to be a little bit more careful. So if the greatest common denominator of c and n is 1, in other words, c and n are relatively prime. So that's another way to say that. And if ac is equivalent to bc mod n, then what can we do? That's when we can cancel the c. And that's what this says here. So the only time you can cancel is when the factor you're going to cancel C is relatively prime to what you're modding out by, to whatever that N is. And again, that's what this says here. So how would we prove such a thing? Um, in this case, let's think about by definition here um, to say that these things are equivalent mod N. Uh, that says that N divides their difference. And I could factor the C off of that there. Now, what else have I assumed? I've assumed that C and N don't have any factors in common. But this line here says N divides this product here. Well, this is, what can I conclude from that? If N doesn't divide C, right, they share no factors in common, but N divides this product somehow, that means N has to divide A minus B. Again, since N doesn't divide C and the fact that they share no common factor other than one, that's when I can conclude that N has to divide A minus B. So in particular, uh, what do we get? I get that n divides a minus b, and now we're just gonna translate that back into our kind of congruence language or symbols, which says that a is equivalent to b mod n. And remember, that's what we wanted to show. So what did we just show? We just showed that in that case, I can cancel the c's. So moving forward, what we'll look at now is, what if you've got an element a uh, that's in this ring, z mod nz here, um, well, I guess actually, um, think of A as an integer. So when does an integer have a multiplicative inverse, call it A prime, in this Z mod NZ? And then another way to think about that, a different way to say it is, when, uh, whenever I have something like A times A prime is equivalent to one mod N. Remember that's a multiplicative inverse, that these two multiply together should be equivalent to one mod N. Maybe just since we're here, another way to say that is A plus NZ, times a prime plus nz should be equal to one plus nz. Is maybe another way to say this. This is one of the things that makes modern algebra a little bit tricky, is that there are quite a few ways to really say the same thing. And it kind of depends on what book you're using. So what if I do have such an element where there is a multiplicative inverse? Well then what's a quick way to solve this, this linear equation ax is congruent to b mod n, why don't I just uh, multiply both sides by the inverse of a? And so you see then, what should x be? What should the solution be? If I did that, I get that if I multiply both sides, again on the left by a prime, a prime, uh, the fact is that then these two would undo each other, and that's how you get x is congruent to a prime times b mod n. Now that worked pretty well, as long as this element here that's attached to x, the variable, does it have a multiplicative inverse? And maybe something you remember from the proofs class is not every element of this ring, or again, zn, same thing, you're not guaranteed that every single element in there has a multiplicative inverse. Um, so to give you an example of that, let's say you're in z uh, mod 4z, and what if you had something like, you know, two times a prime, is that ever equivalent to one mod four, and does that ever work? And so there's not many elements to choose from. The only choices for a prime I have to worry about are um, zero, one, two, and three, since those are again are the possible remainders when you divide by four. That's the way I typically think about this ring. So you see though, if I just 
go through each of those. Well, a prime can't be zero because this would be zero is equivalent to one, which is silly. Um, a prime can't be one since two is not equivalent to one mod four. A prime, can it be two? And so two times two is equivalent to zero mod four. So that doesn't work. That doesn't make this equation true. And the last one, what if a prime is three? Then this would be six, but six mod four, that's two. And so what am I trying to suggest to you? There is no a prime that'll ever make this equation true. So that equation has no solution. So two x congruent to one mod four has no solution in this ring here. That's not good. So it has to do, maybe you remember, with n sometimes here. But how do I find, how do I know when a particular element has a multiplicative inverse? So two does not have one in that ring. So if we move down a little bit, we'll come back to that in a moment. But let's talk about a complete set of residues. And let's talk about also, I see that I skipped something. When you've got an element A that has a multiplicative inverse A prime, we would say that A is what's called a unit in that particular ring. So a unit just means it's an element that has a multiplicative inverse. So in my example that I just did, two is not a unit in Z4, or Z mod 4Z is the way that we'll say it. But uh, if you think about something like three, three times three is equal to nine, which is congruent to one mod four, that says three is its own multiplicative inverse. So three is a unit. And I'm abusing notation a little bit. I really should say three plus four Z, shouldn't I? And I really should say here two plus four Z, shouldn't I? Since I'm in this ring, you know, Z mod four Z. But we'll abuse notation a little bit and you'll have to be careful because the book will too at times. And it's all about context. If you know you're doing computations in Z mod N Z, it might just be uh, quick to just write two and three and just know what you're talking about. That you're really talking about reducing that mod N, in my case, mod four. Okay, so what we'll do then is let's talk about a complete set of residues. And what a complete set of residues is, is it's a subset of the integers where you're basically just picking one representative for each equivalence class. Now, there's a very common way that we do it. I usually just think about what are the possible remainders when I divide by whatever n is. That's kind of naturally what our default complete set of residues is. So like for example, when n equals five, I'm gonna do a little extra one above it, usually I would take zero, one, two, three, and four as my complete set of residues mod five. But another perfectly good choice is zero, one, negative one, two, and negative two. So the point is negative one is another representative of the equivalence class that has two, right? They represent the same equivalence class mod five. Similarly, uh, what's another one? I'm sorry, negative one represents the same one as four. I matched those the wrong way. So those have the same, those represent the same numbers mod five. And uh, negative two is the same as three uh, mod five. So again, just as long as you've picked a single element to represent each equivalence class, then you've got a complete set of residues. But one more time, naturally, this is kind of our default complete set of residues. Our default complete set of residues. All right. So here's a little theorem, or I guess it's a lemma it says, right? If you've got a complete set of residues, mod n, and if you've got an integer that's relatively prime to n, well then a times your set of residues is another complete set of residues. In other words, if you scale your set of residues by a, as long as a is relatively prime to n, you've got another complete set of residues. And so to show that here, um, if these two numbers are equivalent to each other mod n, I'll erase some of this, then what do I know? I've assumed that a is an integer that's relatively prime to n, therefore, uh, proposition 210 tells me I can cancel these a's. So I get that x is congruent to x prime mod n. Now, what do I know? I know that x and x prime were both supposed to be from the complete set of residues r, but I'm only supposed to have, you know, one element, one representative for each equivalence class. And what this says is that x and x prime both represent that equivalence class. It would be sort of like up here if I tried to tack on six into this set. You know, I don't need to, it's redundant, it's too much. I've got one already. And so what can we conclude then? We should be able to conclude that x actually has to be equal to x prime. So not just that they're equivalent mod n, in fact, they are equal. Because again, it's a complete set of residues. 
And so what can we say then? Well, by this logic, all the elements of this set a times r, which again, I'm just saying these are the multiples of r where you've scaled it by a, uh, each one of these has a distinct reduction mod n, right? They should reduce to the same thing. And that's what we've just showed. And also, uh, since a r has n things in it, and how do I know that? Well, look at a particular equivalence class. Maybe think about z5 up here, right? And its set of residues has five things in it. That's what n was, right? Well, if I scale that by, say, 3, right? 3 is relatively prime to 5. Another complete set of residues would be 0, 3, uh, 1. I guess I'll do it this way. If I multiply that, 0, 3, uh, 6. Um, why am I having trouble? Why did I scale by 3 again? Yeah, 9 and uh, 12. That's another good set of residues for Z5 here. Uh, it still has five things in it. And that's all this is trying to say here. When you scale that set, you still have the same number of elements in it. That's what I'm trying to convince you of comparing these two. So finally, what have you got? You've got a unique representative for each equivalence class, and each equivalence class is represented. Therefore, you've got a complete set of residues. Now, what can we use that for? Why did we talk about that? Because what we'd like to do is we'd like to look at a ring such as, say, um, z mod 4z. And we saw that not every element in here is a unit. Not every element has a multiplicative inverse. I'd like to know which ones are multiplicative, which ones are units, which ones do have multiplicative inverses. So, for example, 2 was not, but we showed that 3 is. Or maybe more specifically or more, um, more accurately, 2 plus 4z is not, but uh, 3 plus 4z is a unit. Now, what is kind of the rule? How do you find the units in z mod nz? You're just looking at um, the integers that are relatively prime to n. So if the GCD of a and n is 1, then the equation ax is congruent to b mod n has a solution, and that solution is unique mod n. And uh, in this case, this here says that a is a unit in z mod nz. And that is when I know that this equation should have a unique solution. And so the proof of that relies on the fact that you can find a complete set of residues mod n. Maybe it's just 0 up through n minus 1. Again, sort of that natural choice. And uh, in particular, that says there's a unique element of r that's congruent to b mod n. Right? Exactly one of those from your complete set of residues should be congruent to b. So example, if my b was like 17 and my n is 5, if I took this to be my complete set of residues right here, then 2 would be my element of r that's congruent to my b. So just to emphasize that we can do that there. Now, if I scale that set of residues by a, that is another complete set of residues. And so there is a unique element again, a times x, that's congruent to b mod n. So in particular, ax is congruent to b mod n, just with symbols. And so uh, maybe on a more abstract level, or maybe algebraically, it tells me that uh, as long as the GCD of a and n is equal to 1, then if I define this function, say, from z mod nz to itself, where I just multiply elements on the left by a, that's a bijection. That's a one-to-one -one and onto function. So like, for example, here is this. 2x is congruent to 3 mod 7. And if I take kind of, you know, the default complete set of residues for z mod 7z, um, again, we'll call those cosets or equivalence classes, whatever you want to say. Well, then 2 times that would be equal to, you know, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and 12, which we might think about as instead of 8, we'd probably call it 1. Uh, and instead of 10, we might call it 3. Instead of 12, we might call it 5. Uh, why is that useful then? Well, because I see how to do, how to solve 2x congruent to 3 mod 7. I see that this is, this tells me that 2 times 5 is congruent to 3 mod 7. So whenever the GCD of a and n is not 1, you're not guaranteed that the equation has a solution. It could, but it doesn't have to. So again, this is the example I did above. 2x congruent to 1 mod 4 has no solution, but 2x congruent to 2 mod 4 certainly does. And here is maybe a more general criteria for whether a linear, um, a, uh, um, linear congruence equation, how did I want to call that? I had a brain fart there. A linear equation mod n, that's what I was looking for. How do you know when it's solvable or not? So ax congruent to b mod n has a solution if and only if the GCD of a and n actually divides b. So the GCD of these two 
I'm sorry, the GCD of A and N has to divide what this B is. That's when you know you've got a solution that'll make this true. So what's the proof of this look like here? Um, the proof is, well, let's fix some notation. Let's let little g be the GCD of A and N. So what if there, what if it did have a solution? So again, this is kind of the forward direction. Let's suppose that it does have a solution and let's call it X. So X is a solution to AX congruent to B mod N. Well then by definition, right, this uh, equivalence relationship tells me that N divides their difference, AX minus B, right? Move this B to the other side, N divides that difference. Now let's think about G. G is the greatest common denominator, or greatest common divisor for A and N, therefore you could factor a G out of it. In other words, G divides both N and A. Now if G divides both N and A, think about this, so uh, in this case, right, um, what could you do? Something like n times y is equal to ax minus b. If I move that ax over, ny minus ax equals b, what we're saying is you could factor a g off of both n and a. Therefore, you could factor a g out of the left side, which says that g divides b as well, if you, because b is by itself over here. And so why is that good? Well, we just showed that's the GCD of a and n divides b. That's what that just showed, g divides b. Now let's do the other direction of the if and only if. So let us suppose now that G divides B. Then um, what else am I assuming? Well, I have that AX is congruent to B mod N. So N, when does N divide AX minus B? That's going to be true if and only if I should be able to divide everything by G as well, if G divides B. So in other words, all these things make sense. G divides N and A and I'm assuming that G divides B, so that G also divides everything in this expression as well. So if I'm here now, let's think about when does AX congruent to B mod N have a solution? Well, I should be able to, again, divide everything by G. So this should have a solution exactly when this has a solution. Now, if G is the greatest common denominator of A and N, well then the numbers you have left a over g and n over g have no factors in common. So in particular, their greatest common denominator is one or greatest common divisor is one. So that in that case then, those two, these two numbers are relatively primed to each other. And that tells me that this equation here, since this and this are relatively prime, the previous equation tells me that this congruence has a unique solution. And so what did I mean by the previous result is what I was going for. The previous results here, right here. So because this and this, I'm sorry, A and N are relatively prime, that's just what this says, I know that this equivalence relationship here has a unique solution. So that is where we're using that previous one. That's where we're using proposition 2.1.13.